So this session is on metabolic regulation, and the first speaker is David Sabatini, my colleague. So David uh, gained his MD-PhD at Johns Hopkins in 1997, and it was actually here that he began to study the role of uh, TOR, which is really his life's work. He then became a Whitehead Fellow and continued that work, and in 2002 um, became an official faculty member at MIT and a member of the Whitehead Institute. Um, he is also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And his lab is generally interested in cell growth and the metabolism of cancer. And as I said, he's particularly well known for his contributions to the field of the TOR pathway. And the title of his talk is mTOR Signaling and Cancer Metabolism. David. Okay, thank you, Jackie, for, for the introduction. Also, I, I want to personally thank Matt Vanderheiden, really, for being the brainchild for most of the invitations and actually for doing the majority of the work. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to do something with an assistant professor who uh, goes on and, and does so much work. Uh, I also want to thank personally all the, uh, the guests, uh, the, the speakers who came, and all of the attendees. So we've really been interested in, in three areas. Uh, as Jackie mentioned, one is the regulation of growth, mostly through the, through the TOR pathway. We've also done a lot of technology development, uh, largely in RNAi libraries. And much more recently, we've also become interested in cancer metabolism, largely because of the realization that this pathway, the TOR pathway, is a major sensor of metabolites and nutrients, and also a major regulator of metabolism. So I'll tell you two stories, one on amino acid sensing by the TOR pathway, and another one on amino acid metabolism in, in, in the cancer metabolism field. So really, amino acids are what connect both of these. So despite really the, the obviousness, the size variation as a feature of biological systems as shown here, we actually know relatively little about what controls the sizes of cells, much less about what controls the size of organs and body size. The TOR pathway along with the HIPPO pathway are turning out to be the, the main regulators of growth in all eukaryotes. Now, insight into the TOR pathway comes, as many of you will know, from kind of an interesting angle, and that is from this small molecule, rapamycin. I would argue this is one of the more interesting molecules out there. It's a natural product. It's uh, made by bacteria, found originally on, on Easter Island, where you find these very interesting uh, statues that people don't really understand their, their significance. And this molecule has had profound clinical impact, as shown here in, in immunology, in, in cardiology, and increasingly in cancer. It's also led to the discovery of the TOR pathway, which is turning out to be really a, a fundamental basic pathway that operates in many, many different physiological uh, processes. Now, rapamycin was sort of an obscure molecule Molecule, not in the science world, but in, in the sort of the popular press. And, and in the last few years, there's been a, sort of an explosion of interest in it with the finding that rapamycin prolongs lifespan really in many different model organisms, but particularly even in middle-aged uh, mice. And this is one of the few FDA-approved molecules that will do this, and quite a, quite a significant effect on lifespan. So since 2002, uh, we knew quite a bit about this pathway. We already thought it was very complicated. And this is a slide that I pulled out um, from back then. At this point, we already knew that mTOR was the central component of this pathway. This was perturbed uh, by rapamycin, as I'll mention later on. We also knew that mTOR was a regulator of the balance between anabolism and catabolism, so an inhibitor of catabolic processes, such as autophagy, as, as we'll hear later on, and also a regulator of anabolic processes, for example, protein synthesis, ribosome biogenesis. And increasingly, there's interest in the transcriptional regulation, which we now largely know is me metabolism-driven, either through the HIF pathway or the SRBB pathway. The feature of this pathway that's always fascinated us, and I still think is the most interesting aspect of it, is that this pathway, unlike most signaling systems, pretty much senses everything. So all kinds of nutrients, energy levels, different stresses, all types of growth factors, oxygen levels. And so this tells us the cell cares a lot about connecting the environment to the activity of, of the TOR pathway. And we've been particularly fixated on understanding how this actually happens at a molecular event and how these events can actually be integrated to give coherent growth rates and therefore cell size uh, increases. Now, since this time, there's been an explosion of knowledge in, in this pathway. We know that this original pathway that we called mTOR pathway is now actually the mTOR complex one pathway, or mTORC1. I'll talk a little bit more about this. And the realization has been that mTOR doesn't act alone. It actually is part of large multi-protein complexes within the cell, which define mTORC1 and a related complex that has some similar proteins in it, but some different ones as well, that we now call mTORC2, or mTOR complex two. 
I'm not going to talk more about this, uh, this pathway, but this turns out to be part of the PI3 kinase pathway, and one of the kinases that activates uh, AKT. Now, both of these complexes are intimately connected to, uh, to cancer. In the case of mTORC1, there are many mutations that were first discovered in cancer-prone syndromes, uh, so relatively rare diseases, but increasingly are being found in common cancers through cancer genome sequencing efforts. And so, really, you can see mTORC1 is surrounded by these tumor suppressors and, and uh, oncogenes. And mTORC2 is part of the PI3 kinase pathway, therefore, is, is part of one of the most common mutated pathways in cancer. This has led a drive there to develop inhibitors that target uh, these complexes. Uh, the original uh, inhibitors are really rapamycin, which we call the, the limus compound. Serolimus is another name for rapamycin. And there's a number of these. These are all, in essence, derivatives of rapamycin. And these are molecules that we now, in hindsight, we realize are quite complicated. These are allosteric inhibitors of mTOR, and they partially inhibit mTOR1. They don't fully inhibit its activity. And in fact, in certain cases, can even inhibit mTOR2. This has led a drive to develop an, a second set of, of inhibitors. These are much simpler to understand. These are all ATP competitive inhibitors that target the kinase domain that's shared by both of these complexes. And you can see there's a number of these different inhibitors, some which are more or less uh, specific. Some also target uh, PI3 kinase. These are likely to be more effective, these, this class of inhibitor, but also are likely to have much more toxic effects, which rapamycin, surprisingly, is a relatively benign molecule. So let me show you a little bit about the growth control by mTORC1 in vivo. What you're looking at here is a mouse liver. You can see here's like a normal liver. Here's a, next to it is a liver in which we've inhibited mTORC1 genetically. You can see it's about 40% smaller and pathway activity is down. And conversely here we've activated the pathway and the liver is larger and pathway activity is, is up. Many of you know that if you fast an animal overnight, a mouse, it'll lose about 25% of its liver mass. A two-day fast, you'll lose about 40% of its mass. And you can see here, when we inhibited mTORC1, there's no further decrease in, in the size of this liver, indicating that in response to these nutritional cues, this liver is as small as it's going to get. Conversely, when we constitutionally activate this pathway, there's really a resistance to these anti-size effects of fasting. And in this case, this is, as this is really an active degrowth, probably an autophagy-driven uh, degrowth of the liver. So if you think about these hepatocytes in vivo, there's really, there's really two types of messages or two types of signals that they have to respond to to make these types of decisions as to whether to grow or not or, or to actively degrow. One of them, of course, is nutrient levels because no cell should be stupid enough to try to grow or, uh, in the absence of, of the building blocks for both mass as well as energy. And of course, this is why unicellular organisms use nutrients as their main drivers of growth and proliferation. The other signal is more particular to multicellular organisms. They need to have an idea as what the entire body is doing. Therefore, there are hormonal signals that have evolved to transmit to all the cells throughout, this, throughout the organism that the organism itself is in the right state for growth. And insulin is the best known of these, but there are a number of these. So as a growth pathway, then, for you, one needs to integrate both of these classes of signals. And so we've, like, we've been interested in how does the TOR pathway do this, and, and we know quite a bit about this. A lot of this integration happens, for example, from energy levels, oxygen, growth factors, mitogen. It happens at the level of a tumor suppressor called TSC. And through unknown ways, it integrates uh, these, these mechanisms. Um, TSC is a negative regulator of a small G protein called REB. And REB will bind when it's GTP loaded to mTORC1 and strongly activated. In the absence of REB, there is really no activity of this pathway. So it's, it's a key component of this system. The signal that's not shown here, and we've been particularly uh, interested in, is amino acids. This is probably one of the, the primeval signals that this pathway uh, evolved to, uh, to sense. In the absence of amino acids, none of these things work. But amino acids do not go through TSC. And so the question is, how do amino acids work? So you could first ask, well, how about known amino acid sensing pathways? Do they impact this system? And of course, there are some. Uh, for example, neurotransmission relies on glutamate and glycine receptors and other uh, amino acid receptors. However, evidence suggests that this pathway does not sense extracellular amino acids. So we can, we can pretty much ignore these. There are intracellular amino acid sensing pathways, such as the GCN2 pathway that senses uncharged tRNAs. And here again, genetic studies show that this is not uh, relevant. The, the, uh, the important step for us came from the identification of these proteins that we found biochemically uh, bound uh, to mTORC1. These are small GTPases. They're part of the RAS family, although very uh, poorly related to RAS. They're, they're much bigger than RAS. They're about twice the size and they have a domain that we don't know what it does. And they actually come in four different varieties, A, B, C, and D in, in mammals. And what's interesting is that A and B are very similar to each other, almost identical, and C and D are very similar to each other. And for these to be functional, they have to form a heterodimer where there's A or a B or a C or a D. And we, we use A and B interchangeably as well as C and D. And, and these proteins turn out to underlie what we think is an amino acid sensing pathway that is having 
quite a few uh, different sort of twists and turns that we think are, are interesting. So when there's no amino acids, the, the B form has GDP bound, and the D form, or C, has GDP. You add amino acids, and this flips through a mechanism that we don't understand how it works. And importantly, it binds now strongly to mTORC1. And I'll show you a little bit of the data here. You can see minus plus amino acids. There's an interaction when there previously wasn't one. And if we put in cells a mutant of B, they can't hydrolyze GTP. So it's a constituently active B uh, by being always bound to GTP. You can see that there's no longer regulation. Moreover, this uh, mutant, if you put it into cells, will make the pathway insensitive to amino acids. That is, that it will always be constitutively on, even if we remove amino acids. So we, uh, we're a little concerned that we're overexpressing things there. And so we generate knock-in uh, MEFs, or knock-in animals, actually, where we've, we've put in into the RAG A locus. Uh, both uh, alleles are, are this uh, GTP form. You can see in control MEFs, there's nice regulation of this pathway if we look at one of the canonical uh, outputs. But in, in cells where we've knocked in, the, 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 it's a RAG A, GTP, GTP uh, MEFs, there's no regulation. These animals, unfortunately, I don't have time to show you more uh, uh, data on them. These animals die perinatally. Uh, they actually don't have delontal defects, and they share quite a few similarities to animals that are defective for autophagy. So one of our leading hypotheses is that these animals have an issue when they're born because they, in essence, starve to death before they suckle from the mother because they can't induce autophagy, although that remains to be proven. So in a variety of different experiments, we, we've gone on to show that these are proteins are necessary and sufficient to mediate amino acid signaling to mTORC1. But the difficult part has been understanding how they actually work, because the obvious idea that these are simply binders of mTORC1 that activate kinase activity turns out not to be the case. The, uh, the big insight came from when we looked at the localization of mTOR. I'm not sure you can see this too well here, but in the absence of amino acids, mTOR is in this sort of fine speckled pattern that we actually don't know what this uh, represents. When you add amino acids, though, there's this really dramatic, very fast translocation to these vesicular structures that are perinuclear. And I'll show you that this is truly a, a translocation in, in this movie. When we add amino acids to this white box, you can see the appearance of these puncta that are first small and then become larger and coalesce. And so we said, well, the RAGs don't affect mTORC1 kinase activity, that is specific activity. Do they affect its localization? Um, the wild-type proteins, if you put it, overexpress them, they do not. However, if you put in this B form that, that's, that's constitutively loaded with GTP, and, and you may recall I said this, uh, this protein makes the pathway insensitive to amino acid starvation, you can see the appearance of these structures even when there's no amino acids present uh, in the cell. Uh, and so this was a correlation then between this localization and the activity. And ultimately, we went on to show that when we add amino acids, mTORC1 moves to the surface of the lysosome. That's what these structures turn out to be. So not inside, but on the outside of the lysosome, where the RAG proteins, I didn't show you this, are always there. The RAG proteins are actually quite good markers of lysosomes, uh, they, 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 uh, again, on the surface of the lysosomes. So how does this connect to the rest of this, uh, this uh, pathway? Well, the, the, the important insight was that REB is also part of the endomembrane system and also on endosomes and lysosomes. And so we proposed a model where when there's no amino acids, REB and the RAGs on the lysosomal surface, mTORC1 is, is in some other unknown compartment. We add amino acids, mTORC1 translocates the RAGs using them as a docking site and can then encounter this activator REB. And we very much liked this model because this is, in essence, an AND gate. You need amino acids to put mTORC1 next to its activator, but you need all these other inputs for REB to be loaded with GTP. And this could explain why, when you remove amino acids, none of these signals actually work anymore. Now, to prove this model, and I won't show you the data for this, what we've gone on to do is to basically force mTORC1 onto the lysosomal surface by putting lysosome targeting sequences that put it on the surface. And if you do that, the pathway becomes insensitive to amino acids and actually no longer cares about the RAG proteins. They can be deleted.